Welcome into another edition of the KSO Show. Mason Voth, KSU underscore fan, and Drew Galloway here on the Sunday edition as we get ready to recap everything that took place on Saturday between the Wildcats and the Trojans. It was a sad day for T-Roy, uh, maybe my new favorite mascot in college football because the name is – I don't know where they came up with such a creative name. Uh, and then I discovered the fact on the field during the game, and I will keep saying this, that he wears – boxer briefs underneath his little trojan skirt or whatever he has going on there but it's like full mascot legs so it's not like it's just like a human it's like yeah you probably want something to cover up down there no this is uh this he is his mascot body down there so that was fascinating to me uh and fortunately that's where the fascination with troy got to stop because it looked like at one point you might have to be fascinated with how troy played in the football game uh especially headed towards halftime but K-State was kind of able to, to have a little bit of a wake-up call. Everything kind of smoothed itself out, and, and K-State ends up cruising. And it, it's always a good sign when you win 42-13 to 13 and you feel like you didn't play very well. And it's a little bit of a different circumstance than some of the games last year or you know past occurrences where uh, K-State maybe didn't play well, but they snuck out a win in some of these games. K-State was still pretty dominant yesterday. Uh, and and didn't feel great about it walking out of there. So we'll start with kind of the instant takeaways. Drew, we'll let you lead off here. Uh, what's the the biggest thing that stood out to you in K State's win over Troy yesterday? Honestly, the the biggest thing that stood out to me, and it was kind of under the radar from last week that we didn't really talk about it much, was the team speed, especially defensively. It felt like the defense was everywhere, especially in run defense. Uh, Khalid Duke got in the backfield in a hurry on both of his sacks. Will Lee was making plays all over the field. It just felt like the defense has so many players that you're like, oh, that that's a dude. And then you you look and you're they're like, okay, well, now the next wave is in. And those guys are all playing well and playing fast. And it, it's impressive how they've lost so much on defense from last year, but have been so dominant and so and playing so fast and playing with a lot of confidence so fast and so early in the season yeah i mean well and we got to see a, a lot of that yesterday where guys were kind of flying in there they started slow it seemed like yeah they're, they're not doing their best job of getting back there applying some pressure but then once it came it was like the floodgates opened, and khalid duke was able to get back there a lot and troy really had nothing that they could do from that point forward they also i mean we'll talk about the defensive line later They've completely shut down the run for both opponents the first two games, which has been really impressive, especially considering the concerns were going to be on the defensive line with we didn't know the nose guard situation. Three very unproven guys going to have to step in there and, and take charge. And then also, like you, you talk about the pass rush, we know that there are capable guys there, but all three of Khalid Duke, Brennan Mott, and Nate Matlack have shown great promise and great moments in their K-State careers, but now they have to do it on a more consistent basis with Felix and DK Uzama gone. And so far things have gone pretty well for him there. So uh, it's, it's been a good start uh, in a lot of areas for, for the K-State defense fan. What, what are your big takeaways from yesterday that stick out immediately? I, th I thought it was one of those games where um, perception is not always reality. I think it, it, it was one of those games where it felt like, uh, for at least a portion, in case they didn't play very well, and I think part of that was Troy coming back to cut it to <clears throat> fourteen to ten right before halftime, and uh, then looking at the struggles in in on offense, the turnover, and not being able to run the ball for a while. So I think it, it kind of got it, it felt like they played a lot worse. But then when you step back and look at you know, like you said, you beat a a, a team that had won twelve games in a row, forty two to thirteen team that's used to winning. I know they had some major losses on defense and, and were perhaps without their best player this year still uh, defensive end. Uh, but K-State still did a lot of things really well, put them away in the second half. I thought the defense really responded to that little two-drive series to end the half for Troy where they gave up 10 points. Uh, part of that was, you know, giving up 25 yards of, and penalties on that last drive that, where the Troy got the touchdown. So looking back, you know, really K-State did a lot of really good things in that game um, and, and probably played better than a lot of fans. You know, you look at Twitter, you would have thought we barely eked out a three-point win yeah. based on some of the stats, and you would have thought Will Howard had 14 interceptions based <laughs> on some of the comments about Will Howard. So I, I think 
really a pretty solid win when we look back at this season. And and we'll see how Troy does. Maybe they get, are going to fall apart. and Maybe they are a paper tiger, as D.Y. has tried to tell us all last week. But uh, I think maybe, in my perception, they might be a little bit better than I thought going into this season. I mean, that they, they, they came out and they gave K-State a good push there. And I think that's kind of what ultimately K-State and everybody watching wanted out of that game, where you wanted Troy – to give a little bit of a resistance at some point, but then K-State pull away comfortably, assert their dominance, and and see that there's a difference between a team that won a Power 5 conference last year and a team that won the Sun Belt, and that's exactly what came about. I mean, Troy, this is – I'd have to go back to to 2021 and look, but this is the most points that they gave up, obviously just two games this year and all of last season. They played 14 games. The most they gave up last year was 32 to App State. They only gave up 28 in their loss to Ole Miss last season. So, it, I mean, it is a, a pretty solid defense. Um, going back and looking, uh, this is the most points that a, a team has scored on Troy since November 20th of 2021. App State scored 45 uh, in a 45-7 to win. So, it, it's been tough to score to that extreme that K-State did, and they largely did it without turnovers. I mean, they got the one interception from Will Lee, Wildcat, but, I mean, I after that pick, that was when Will threw his pick, right? So, uh, K-State didn't capitalize off of it. And they got the, you know, fumble recovery at the end, I guess. Um, although I was walking into the press conference room, so maybe it got overturned. I don't know. There was – D.Y. was stopping and looking and trying to figure out what was going on. I was like, I don't really care. The game's over. Just keep on moving. Um, but, like – it wasn't like K-State was starting with short fields by any means. They had to go and get every one of those six touchdowns that they got yesterday, and that's impressive that they were able to do it uh, against Troy. Moving on now to, uh, you know, everybody's favorite part. You know, you just talked about it, fan. Will Howard throwing 14 interceptions yesterday despite only throwing one and, again, you know, racking up touchdown passes and other scores and uh, doing a lot of good things still. Where is uh, your cause for concern on this team? after uh, game number two. And and if it's about the offensive line, um, I pro- you're probably not alone, and, and we'll definitely be talking about that very soon. Yeah, it's it's definitely the, the offensive line slash consistency of the run game. Um, just not having that – it was a lot, a lot like last week. There was just a period of time where K-State seemingly couldn't run the ball. They started the game well. The first 13 carries got 68 yards – had a 61% success rate. You'll take that anytime, over five yards of carry. The last 10 carries were actually pretty good too. Uh, 49 yards, almost five yards of carry, 70% success rate. But you have a middle section of the game on just run calls. K-State gained 25 yards on 13 carries. That's obviously not very good, less than two yards of carry. And the success rate of 15% in that middle portion of the game, mainly in the second <clears throat> and third quarter. So, You've got to get that fixed. I think uh, it points to the fact that uh, the loss of Christian Duffy is is a bigger impact than probably anybody anticipated, and getting him back is going to be key because they haven't really seemed to find the right mix to be consistently good um, throughout the course of the game with uh, with the offensive line. So that 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 would be my concern again after last week too. I I think real quick on that, like it, it that just goes to show. Really, this is my philosophy with injuries in basically every sport that most of the time when a guy goes down, it's actually less about the guy that got hurt and more about the guy that then has to come and fill in in that absence. And we're seeing that with the K-State offensive line where, like you said, like Christian Duffy probably thought of as the third best offensive lineman on this roster behind Cooper Beebe and KT Leviston but would likely be my guess with how people think of things and see it. I could see others saying that maybe he's number two, um, but that's probably where I, I think that he would fall in the pecking order. So initially you go, man, it, it sucks to lose him, but K-State can overcome it. But what we're seeing is right now they're, they're not in the position to fully overcome it. And I you know watch, I trying to watch back as much of the game as like I could this morning um I, I got through you know most of the first half the the success running the football at least on those early Treshawn Ward runs they were kind of more to the, they they favored the right side they were getting a little bit further outside not directly inside and that came with Cooper Beebe at, at right tackle and and having to move him around to to do what you want to do I think it fan you're more of the expert than me but it's easy when you want to go out and 
establish something and say, okay, we're going to start the game with Cooper Beebe at right tackle, and we can we know we can run that way now. But when you get into the flow of the game and you need to start mixing things up more, it would become very obvious if you're moving Cooper Beebe back and forth between tackle and guard to do whatever you need to do and, and get your protections and everything. And I think that's uh, probably where K-State is struggling right now. So D.Y. mentioned it yesterday. I, I We all can see it like, Obviously, getting Christian Duffy back would be huge for the Missouri game. And even if they were able to get a guy like John Pastore back into game action, it's at least another body they can try. Because obviously, at one point in in the third quarter yesterday, they were trying a lot of different things on the offensive line. We saw Andrew Lyngang for probably, I think, first extended reps of the season out there. They're just trying to find some answers because they are obviously aware that it's a little bit of an issue right now. Um, Drew, what what is your cause for concern uh, moving forward with with this K State team? And also, a forty two to thirteen win and kicking everybody's butt through two games, you're allowed to say that you don't have much that you're worried about. That's okay to say if if that's where you're at. I mean, the the offensive line is a concern to me, not just in the run game, but it, where it's most noticeable, I think, has been like goal to go situations wh- where K State has kind of had to really grind out like a second and goal or even a third and goal, like Will Howard's QB sneak. They didn't get a lot of push. They mm-hmm. had to go to a, a, a jet sweep with uh, Philip Brooks to score on a second and goal. Like, I, I feel like that's where you're noticing it the most. It, and it's kind of something that like people have talked about like, with the chiefs offensive line too, uh, during NFL games that like the chiefs for how good their offensive line is supposed to be. Like the chiefs have done some creative stuff in the goal line because they aren't getting a lot of push. It looks like the, that K-State just isn't getting enough push on the interior right now. And, it, and it, it's like that when you have Cooper Beebe on the outside because of the interior struggles that they've kind of had to really grind out in the red zone and, and especially in goal-to-go situations. That That's a little cause for concern going forward because you play a team like Texas that has an explosive offense. You can't be settling for field goals in the red zone. Yeah, well, and Texas proved last night that their defensive line can be very impressive. They were really good against Alabama. And, I, I mean, I think that also, like, it's it's been a trend now for two weeks because Will Howard had the failed quarterback sneak against SEMO as well. And they tried giving it to Treshawn Ward instantly against SEMO and at, like, the one-yard line, and it didn't work. And that's one of those deals where you'd like to see a little bit more because, I mean, they, they've had to kind of do a little bit more of – maybe trying to surprise people with Will Howard running the ball. Obviously, we, we saw it yesterday. They are going to run Will Howard a little bit more this year because they know that they can they can make it pop at times. But they kind of had a, you know, like Peyton Manning style, oh, this guy's not going to run on us, and having pull it out against SEMO and take off. They they just kind of went power with him up the gut yesterday to score, and the, the Phillip Brooks touchdown that had to happen on the sweep, like, that's a concern because normally no matter who the coach has been or who the personnel has been, K-State's been really good in those short yardage situations. And another one, I think this was in yesterday's game, DJ Giddens had to do his best to stay on his feet and fight for a first down on like a, a third and three or something um, that he was basically instantly knocked off balance and tripped up. Uh, so all of these guys are having to find ways to get creative and fight to keep things alive. And it, it's definitely concerning right now. We'll see where it goes. Um, I mean, the offensive line is, is good. It's, it's probably better than most. I think this is something that a lot of people realize over the course of a season. Most offensive lines are not actually that good at, at any level, mm-hmm. like college football, the NFL, you look around and you realize that most of these are built off of having one probably really great player, Cooper Beebe, and then one or two other guys that are, are probably getting close to being, you know, getting honors of some kind. And then everything else is just kind of, hey, these guys work. They know what they're doing, but they're going to get beat sometimes, and it's going to put us in a tough spot. And I, I think that's where K-State stands. Like, I, for years, I have watched the Dallas Cowboys offensive line be touted as this awesome offensive line. They've not been awesome for, like, seven years at this point. But they kind of, you know, get that notion of, hey, this is a good offensive line. And they still have some really talented players there. But also you've got guys that are kind of just like revolving doors, letting the defensive line bust on through and, and cause issues. Um, and I don't think K-State's that bad, but I say that just to put into perspective that there are a lot of other offensive lines out there that are in a, are in a lot worse shape than K-State's. So when we talk about this, 
This is obviously relative to K-State's situation and then also just the fact that K-State could be more successful because we know the talent at running back that Trayshawn Ward and DJ Giddens are. And so there are expectations for them as well, but it's tough for those guys to meet it if they're not going to be getting much help at times up front. Uh, another offensive concern possibly for maybe like two drives yesterday was Will Howard. Uh, he decided to uh, chuck one deep, mm, very questionable ball. He's done that a few times this year. You saw it in the game against SEMO. He got away with it a couple times. He did get picked off on one of them, um, but he kind of got the, the, the break that the offensive line, speaking of them, uh, just let Will Howard get smoked so he didn't get much Ooh. power on the throw that led to the pick. But the throw that he made yesterday was all on him. Um, I think this stems from an overconfidence in himself and his receivers, which is not always a bad thing. It's just a matter of, I think – he's going to have to scale down and, and learn and kind of re-remember which moments are meant for taking that shot and the situation and also considering who you're trying to throw it to in what situation and then also having to learn when you need to scale it back. I, I think that's all it comes down to. It's not in like an alarming concern. It certainly seems that way when it's only, you know, 14 to 10 against Troy in the second quarter and you're, you're thinking, oh, what, what's going to happen here? Um, but in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't that big of a deal yesterday, but it's something to monitor moving forward. Uh, Drew, I'll start with you on, on your take on this. What have you seen from Will Howard in these first two games? And uh, are you in the boat of, of panicking a little bit about his decision making? Uh, see, I'm kind of like you where I think that it's not necessarily a bad thing that he has so much confidence in himself and the receivers. Because, like, if you flash back to a year ago at this time, we, we were in the situation where, like, where we, we were begging Adrian Martinez to make those kinds of throws. So it's it's nice to see him have so much confidence in himself and the receivers. Uh, the one thing that I've really I've noticed so far is that it, it doesn't look like he's going through a ton of progressions. And it looks like it's kind of been like a one read and throw, which honestly has been kind of like a scheme thing because it's kind of been that way since he took over as a starting quarterback. But it, it and I, I really like the rapport he has early with Keegan Johnson. I mean, we saw Keegan Johnson very rare or for a little bit in the second half, and he he probably played like 12, 15 snaps somewhere in that range. And they immediately had a connection, and it was impressive to see Johnson's adjustment on the catch that the second catch that he made, the diving catch to do that with not having very many game reps. So you can really tell, and you can tell that he has that same connection with all of the receivers because he wasn't afraid to throw to Jaden Jackson in double coverage who made a great play on the ball too. Yeah, well, Jaden Jackson is a guy that is uh, early on. There's obviously something there with him and, and Will, or at least uh, he's he's gotten open enough for Will to let one fly. I'll go to you now. Where, where do you see this whole thing with Will Howard and where do you stand on it? Because it, I, I just, I think it should be said again. It's not like he's playing bad football right now. He is just making some bad decisions. And I, and kind of what Drew and I just talked about, I think it's important to also know where the bad decisions are coming from, where we've seen quarterbacks and quarterbacks at K-State make bad decisions because they, they're doing it from a place of fear or lack of talent at that point in time, which I would say is Will Howard years one and two. Um, and now we're seeing it come from a different place, which is actually a good thing to have with your confidence and everything. Yeah, I, I, I think you nailed it with that. I think uh, I, I, I'm not concerned. I, you know, I would rather have a guy that wants to try to make some of those tight throws once in a while. Uh, and really trust his receivers to go get the ball. I mean, I think the Jaden Jackson catch over the middle, the 40-yarder, really highlights that. I think that's what he was expecting on the end zone throw to Garcia <clears throat> that got picked off. Um, and then that safety just outran the ball. It was kind of – it was weird because, you know, I, 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 I don't know if he thought Garcia would run through it a little bit more or what because it obviously was double coverage. Autumn well, safety picked him up. and uh, But I – <clears throat> this is much different Will Howard than like you, you mentioned it well, Will Howard one and two um, was, was a little more cautious and in, in making mistakes. This is a Will Howard that just believes every ball is going to be a big play and he's going to complete balls into coverage with two or three defenders around the guy and makes and trusts his receivers to go get it. And, you know, that speaks to, you know, Jackson 
caught 100% of his targets yesterday. Brooks caught 78% of his targets yesterday. And, and Keegan Johnson caught 75%. And then Garcia was the one that struggled with 38% uh, catch rate on his targets. So I think part of it was maybe, <clears throat> you know, I'd, I, you'd have to – I'd have to also see what the actual scheme was on some of those plays and, and, and what the route progression was. And it could be that Garcia also had a bad day um, with some of those routes as well. So we'll see, like I said, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not concerned. I think this is the Will Howard we want to see. And I hope he ke- keeps trying to make some, some plays. couple notes on, on Will Howard, just to calm everybody down. Well, first an opinion. Uh, I did say at the beginning of the year, that Will Howard would break the single-season touchdown passing record. On pace for that right now. He's got five of them currently. I did also say that Will Howard will throw, uh, like, on a per-game basis, he will throw more interceptions this year. He is going to throw more picks because we're going to see him put it in the air and make throws that a lot of other K-State quarterbacks have either not attempted or couldn't make. And I think we're going to see that. And that's just how this works. Like, you throw the ball a lot, there are going to be interceptions, right? whether it, whoever it is. The, basically, the only guy that plays quarterback that throws the ball a lot and doesn't throw interceptions is Aaron Rodgers, and that's because he doesn't take enough chances. Like, say what you will about Colin Cowherd. I am 100% on board with that Cowherd take. Like, Rodgers keeps a lot in the holster because he wants to protect his completion percentage and his interception number and all that. Will Howard's not worried about any of that. Will Howard just wants to go out there and make winning plays. Now – a couple other things to note on Will Howard. He, he's 28th in the country in QBR right now. 70, 76 is what it's at. So even through these games where there have been a couple of questionable throws and you can be a little bit more willy-nilly with how you, you handle the football and, and try and make some more plays, he's still one of the better quarterbacks in, in college football at this point in time just from QBR, which isn't the gospel, but it's at least the number that there you know it makes sense if you look at it. Now, other numbers here. This this comes from K-State after the game yesterday. Uh, Howard, it was a 17th start yesterday at quarterback. Um, he threw for 250 yards, three touchdowns, and then the 33 rushing yards and two touchdowns there. His two rushing touchdowns tied a career high. He originally set in 2021 against Nevada. He now has 29 passing touchdowns in his career, which is tied for ninth in school history with Lynn Dickey. And then with his three touchdown passes on Saturday – uh, he becomes the first K-State quarterback with multiple touchdown passes in seven straight regular season games since Josh Freeman did it in 2007 and 2008. So, and again, Josh Freeman, obviously Jake Waters is in there, but Will Howard, probably the best thrower of the football since Josh Freeman at K-State. I, would you both agree with that? Yeah, I, I would definitely agree. Um, just a couple of no- national numbers, predicted Predicted points added just in the passing game, which is just the efficiency number. K-State is number 17. And pass play success rate, they're number 15 in the country. So it's pretty good pass offense through two games. Yeah, I, they're, they're doing fine there. And the receivers, I think the, the, the best thing that you can say about Will Howard is we had questions about the receivers, but they've all had enough opportunities through two games already where – we feel better about them moving forward where you look at it and say, okay, I, I trust more of these guys than maybe I thought uh, originally. And you don't get that if, if Adrian Martinez games one and one, two and three last year is at quarterback and you're only throwing it, you know, 13 times and the ball's going three yards in the air. So um, that also is, is something that kind of highlights what Will Howard is doing for them. Um, moving on now, we'll, we'll shift to the other side of the ball and look at the defense, which has proven now that it is, a full-on strength for the Cats. Certainly everything up front. I mean, I think going into the year, the linebackers were probably going to be considered as either the best or the second-best unit that K-State had up there with the offensive line. And now we have seen that they haven't played bad by any means, but defensively, the defensive line has taken the shine away from the linebackers because they've been really, really good up front. Fan, I'll let you lead off here. What have you seen from the the defensive line and then the defense as a whole uh, through the first two games? Well, I, I think we we talk about tackles for loss, TFLs, as like you like to call them, Mason. Yes. Um, oh, another TFL! <laughs> I better be careful. The KU fans were not happy with my food review. Uh, they have been quite quite nasty in in my mentions. Uh, I realized yesterday when I got home from the game, I was like, oh, okay, all right. They, they don't understand. I even say it in the video. 
I am there because I, I am friends with an Illinois grad. Like I was sitting in the Illinois friends and family section, <laughs> like uh, player tickets were given to me. It's not like I just showed up as some random guy. Like yeah, I'm going to root against the Jayhawks today. Like, <laughs> come, come on people. But anyways, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think we had nine yesterday. Uh, and the havoc rate was 22 percent which is which is a really good number havoc includes uh, passes broken up interceptions and forced fumbles as well um, you'll take that every time and the havoc rate was was better than troy's success rate which was just 21 percent so anytime you're doing that to a team um, means your defense is dominated really they had one play of 46 yards was uh, the, the the long run they had which is you know I think more than the rest of the total yards K-State's rush defense has given up all year. And then you had the the drive before halftime where they gave up really it was only a 50-yard drive when you when you give 25 yards away on two penalties, especially that one the, the rough in the passer which would have been I, think, I believe fourth down at the time. So um overall I you know this def- the rush defense is pretty incredible. The other thing is teams are don't want to rush the ball against K-State. I think 63% of opponent play so far have been passes, which is like number eight in the country. So teams are not running the ball. And when they try to run it, they're not having any any success at K-State. And then, you know, even even the pass defense, you know, some people were concerned, but Tr- Troy also made a couple ridiculous catches uh, t- to, to get some big plays, third down conversions, et cetera. So I think the defense has been really, really good and uh, very impressive work by Klanerman and his unit this year. Drew, where uh, where do you stand on the the defense right now? Or have they been awesome, or have they been fantastic? Uh, I'd I'd go fantastic. I mean, the, this has been a crazy first two games for this defense because the the Troy offense, even though it's not like super potent, it was capable. They scored forty eight points against Stephen F. Austin and played pretty well. And the CMO offense had three or four. FCS All Americans and shut them out. So what we're seeing right now is just dominance, and especially at the line of scrimmage. But I mean, we've hit on it a few times now. The defensive line has been so good, and it's really kind of overshadowed every other position because, like the, the corners, uh, Will Lee and Jacob Parrish yesterday were really, really good. But I feel like in the grand scheme of things, when you look at the game as a whole that kind of gets glossed over because you see how dominant the defensive line was. Yeah. I mean, in the defensive line, like uh, everything they've done, like Troy had no shot on a lot of their short yardage things yesterday. And you go in and just kind of look, they were able to get pressure. It's, it's always good when, you know, you get to see Khalid Duke go fishing a couple times. So uh, good outcomes there yesterday. Secondary, we got to see them tested a little bit more. Jacob Parrish had a good day uh, showing what he can do back there. Will Lee, Wildcat, came away with his first interception as a Wildcat. Uh, people, Some people are going to go, what is he doing there? And others are going to know exactly what I'm doing and think that it's very funny. And others are going to know what I'm doing and think, hey, we should do that inside Bill Snyder Family Stadium. Uh Hey, but, we know a guy. We know yeah, we a do guy. know a guy. Yeah, yeah. I talked to him pounding an ice cream sandwich at halftime yesterday. <laughs> um, I, you know, the secondary we got it tested a little bit more yesterday. We kind of expected that, just given the the circumstance. And Troy made some, as was already mentioned, some very special catches yesterday. And there was the one ball that set Troy up, I think, inside the ten, or at least it was in, into the red zone that Keenan Garber was in coverage mm-hmm. on. Keenan Garber, I thought, did a really good job there. It was just like the perfect throw and dropping it in there. And in addition to that, it looked like the ball went through like the gap between Garber's pointer finger and his thumb. Like it was that close to being just a perfect deflection. Instead, it ended up with a big play for Troy. Um, Obviously, we'll we'll see a little bit more of a test this coming week because even though I I don't know if Brady Cook is a better quarterback than Gunnar Watson, but Missouri obviously has – uh, I mean, top of the line. Who knows? Troy might have a better receiver than what Mizzou has, but we know that Luther Burden uh, can be special, and they they're going to have better depth and and be able to throw more guys out there that can test your receiver. Um, what did you guys think of, of the secondary yesterday in their first test, and then also uh, what what they might see against Missouri? 
I think, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, <clears throat> Troy made great catches. You, you talked about it as well. Um, Troy only gained 20, had a yardage rate of 29% in the game, which is another stat I like to use, which, you know, figures up how many yards you gain based on how many are possible from where you start. 29% is pretty elite. Uh, average in the Big 12 last year was 47%. So that that kind of tells you a little bit about that number. Um, just just on pass calls, Troy's success rate was only 25%, and they averaged less than 4.4 yards per pass play. Um, they gained 157 yards. Uh, and then I think the defense really stepped up. At halftime, I think their third down conversion rate was 6 out of 10, and then they went 0 for 7 in the second half on third down conversions. And, and most of those are going to be pass plays, of course, as well. So uh, secondary wise, you know, I, I thought it was interesting. We talked during the game several times, Drew, about how many times K State was manned. A couple times they were manned with no safety help, bringing the house. And uh, I thought they fared well because Troy did have some some returning experience at receiver. I don't know how good those guys are. I mean, obviously, the couple of the one handed catches were pretty spectacular. So I think overall, pretty good day. Um, I, I was a little surprised. Uh, their their quarterback has kind of been interception prone during his career. He's been there six years um, in case they only got one from him. And I thought he made some good throws, like you pointed out the one um, to the tight end, which was, which was big, but I'm, I, I'm not, I mean, Missouri will be more of a test in the passing game, but I'm not so sure we didn't see a better quarterback yesterday than we might see next week. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, I thought that the secondary was uh, really good for most of the day. They struggled a little bit on third down, but it's kind of like what a fan just pointed out. It, the most impressive thing to me was how much confidence that they have in everybody at corner that there were multiple times where they went cover zero, no safety help, and it was straight up man all the way across the board because they wanted to get, they wanted to get home and get pressure. And it was impressive to see how well they held up. I mean, the... As much as we like to like talk about how good Jacob Parrish is, we, we all still need to remember he's only a, a true sophomore. He's only started two games. And he looks like he could be a future first team all big twelve pick this year with how, how well he's been playing in the first two games. Yeah, I mean, I he was good yesterday. He I mean, he showed kind of his skills on, on the one pass that was headed out like out towards the numbers and he was ready right with the receiver, tried jumping it. Um, and it was, you know, very close to it, it could have gone the other way. So Jacob Parrish has been good. And we got to see some of the other guys step up yesterday. We saw the debut of Marquis Siegel out there. Uh, he came in instantly first drive and you knew he was out there. I, I compared it to like Josh Hayes last year where Josh Hayes also missed game one. And then the second he got on the field game two against Mizzou, it was like he was just hitting guys immediately. And Marquis Siegel, very first drive came up and second the guy caught the ball he was there made a play uh early impressions of the uh the latest bison to be added to the wildcat roster i thought that he played really really fast uh you can you feel like they're gonna use him more in the josh hayes role and i'm, I'm excited to see how he plays against missouri because like you just mentioned that's kind of where josh hayes really first popped and he's gonna get more of a test uh, this coming week, because I, I think that Missouri might try to throw a little bit more than Troy did, because you could almost argue Troy tried to run a little bit too much yesterday. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're probably right. I thought it was weird. I mean, we they obviously know that their running back by now is probably their best player and their best offensive option, but that, that was not going to work against K State, and they they stayed very committed to it yesterday. Um, he got 17 carries for 83 yards, but if you take off the 46 yarder that he broke off once the game was really already, you know, pretty much decided at that point, that's not the most impressive of days. I have to do my quick math. Well, that's 37 yards on 16 carries. Um, that's that's not anything spectacular there that he was able to do, and you know that's two straight weeks that an offense has come in and their calling card has probably been their running back. And K-State's just not had any troubles with it at all. Um, actually, K I mean, K-State notes that the 70 rushing yards allowed by on Saturday um, means that now the defense has gone two straight games uh, with less than 100 rushing yards for their opponent for the first time since 2021 
when they did it against KU in West Virginia. So th- this is uh, this is a defense that's doing a, a lot of good things right now. They were able to, to step up and, and again, make the, the team trying to run the ball pay. All right, we'll move on here. Uh, I've, I'm retooling our, our, our you know, game where we're going to try and have Drew out a fan and, and some, some trivia here uh, with the, the numbers. I'll, I'm going to give you some numbers that popped up in the K-State postgame notes. I assume you guys are both like me. Typically, I hate to break it to, to the K-State Athletic Department. They, they might be wasting paper because I normally don't pick it up. But yesterday, for some reason, I picked it up and I stuck it in my folder and I took it home with me and I've got it in front of me. And there are three uh, fascinating notes here, at least two uh, that, are, that are notable to me. Now, one of them you might already know. Um, now, this one, though, K-State has scored at least 40 points in each of its last four regular season games dating back to last season. It's the longest streak by the Cats with at least 40 points in regular season games since. Any guesses on what season K-State did that last? I'm going to guess 2012. I, I was literally about to say, I th- I'm going to go with 12, too. It would be 2002. Two. Oh. Nice. Which – Slightly shocking to to me as well. I probably would have guessed 2012, because um, I mean they they started off ripping off points, but I guess that OU game was there, and they only yeah. scored 35 against North mm-hmm. Texas. Um, yeah. Their best stretch was probably they scored 55 two straight weeks against West Virginia and Tech, and then they had 44 against Oklahoma State, um, but then they only won 23 to 10 the next week at TCU. So. That's that's the best stretch they had. They were able to put together three. Obviously, a little different since that 2002 team. It was the same team in the middle of a season. I kind of look at this like, you know, hitting streaks in baseball. It's like, mm, does it really count if you ended game 162 with 17 straight hit games with a hit and then you picked up and you started the first 10 games of this season? They're different seasons, many months apart. I don't really count it, but it is at least notable um, because th- there's another number that gets thrown out here. And actually, a lot of things in the, the notes yesterday after the game for K-State compare them to that era of K-State football. Jaden Jackson scored the first touchdown of the game for the second consecutive week. Uh, it's the first time that a Wildcat had the first offensive touchdown to open uh, play in each of the first two games of a season since a pair of runs by, I'm sure you guys know who, uh, who has that record. Uh, Darren Sproles. Yeah. Yeah. Coincidentally, his second game of that season against Troy. Against so, Troy. Yeah. There you go. Uh, the other number out here that was pointed about K State and uh, what they've been able to do uh, the points surrendered by K State to begin 2023. It's the second straight year that K State has allowed 13 or less points over the first two games. And it's the first time that they've done that since any guesses on the two years that they did that less 13 points or less and the first two games of the season for the K-State opponent. Last year was one. Well, that's what I'm saying. So this year and last year count. So before this, the last time K-State went consecutive years where they allowed 13 points or less to their first two opponents in back-to-back seasons. Maybe like Um, late 90s? I was going to say like, I'll go 2002, 2003. Drew is closer. It's 01 and 02 was the last time uh, that, that K-State was able to, to pull that off. But that, that the, my point with all this is it's pretty good to company for this Wildcat team to be looking up and down. And again, maybe some of these are those like Tim Kirkjian level stats where it's like, oh, well, it was raining on this day in 2004 and he's the only guy to ever do it. It's still whenever you can go through in K-State football history and start comparing a team to things that haven't been done since the early 2000s, that's a that's a really good thing to, to kind of have going for you. So uh, it's at least an encouraging sign as things kind of get going and, and, and start up this year. Uh, moving on now, we'll move on to, to maybe the best part of the show. Time for a little uh, college football outsider action. Again, none of us insiders on things outside of K-State football. We are the outsiders. So uh, I'll start with you, Drew. What is your uh, what was the the game outside of K-State yesterday that caught the most attention from you and, and meant the most? I, I mean, I feel like I, I you have to say probably Texas Alabama because I 
I figured I picked Texas to win in like June, July, and then everybody started to kind of hop on that same bandwagon too. But it, it was impressive to me how Texas was the more physical of the two teams. Like I've never seen an Alabama team get that out physical. Uh, I'll throw out an honorable mention to, I think I brought them up last week. Just Oklahoma State's quarterback situation is so fascinating. They played all three again. They somehow still won again. <laughs> I 27 points back-to-back weeks for the Cowboys also. I, I, eventually, they have to pick one. But I, I'm just fascinated by this whole thing of playing three quarterbacks and saying before the game, we're going to play this guy at this point, this guy at this point, this guy at this point, and we're going to split up all the reps into thirds. I just don't know how that's going to work going forward, but it's fascinating to watch. Very much so. I mean, <laughs> they took Alan Bowman out. I mean, he was in there like first quarter, start of the second, and then they went to Gunnar Gundy. And I thought like Bowman wasn't looking horrible out there. Like he made some, I was like, oh, there's, there's some zip there. Uh, but they they made their switch. And yeah, all three guys get in, basically averaging nine points a quarterback right now uh, is, is how the math <laughs> works out on that one. Uh, Gunnar Gundy, five of seven, 32 yards in a touchdown. Uh, Garrett Rangel, six of nine, 46 in a touchdown. Alan Bowman attempted the most passes, threw for the most yards. Didn't get any of the, the vanity stats that come with it of a touchdown. But uh, it, it's pr- pretty clear that he's probably the, the best quarterback on the roster right now. And I don't think that's saying a lot of good things about Oklahoma State because um, I don't think any of the three are all that good in particular. Um, I mean, I said it when Gundy went in last night. It was like, I can't believe Mike Gundy is putting his very clearly underprepared and overwhelmed son into play quarterback right now. Because very similar to last year against K-State, the second that ball was snapped, Gundy was rolling out. It was like me playing Madden. Like, I'm never staying in the pocket in Madden. I'm rolling out instantly. And it it, it worked. It worked for the Cowboys. Good win for the Big 12 because somebody needed to put the Pac-12 in their place. And uh, I didn't think it would be Oklahoma State who did it because I honestly thought – even though Arizona State is not good, I just kind of assumed that they would they would pull it out at home, at night. Jaden Rashada, even though he's a, a freshman, he's the most talented quarterback that was playing in that game yesterday, and uh, it really didn't matter for them. Fan, uh, where where do you go with your uh, your top notes from yesterday outside of K-State? Well, I, probably because I'm partial to the old Big 12 and, and those Thanksgiving weekend Buffalo – Cornhusker games, the the Colorado continued resurgence under Coach Prime and Nebraska continuing to wallow in mediocrity uh, is enjoyable to watch. Um, I know there's all kinds of hot takes about Coach Dion and and what he's doing at Colorado. I I'm honestly really impressed. I I didn't expect them to be two and zero for sure, um, and uh, I think he's. <clears throat> You know, I think he's probably much more disciplined and in some ways the way he runs his program behind the scenes, much more like Bill Snyder than anyone would ever imagine, mm-hmm. even though he's got the bravado and, and stuff like that. But I know um, I think that's part of why they're having success. We'll see how that continues. I think I think their season could end up looking a lot like KU's last year <clears throat> by the end of the year, but uh just that the atmosphere with that game, just because of the old Nebraska Colorado games, was fun to watch. And then Big Twelve wise, Houston might be really, really bad. Yeah. I, mean, I I watched the end of that game. They had chances to win it, got to overtime, and and couldn't take care of Rice. Rice did kind of push Texas sort of last week, so maybe Rice is better than I'm giving them credit for. But that's a pretty bad loss. Um, and then. Uh, Texas Tech being 0 and 2 is a surprise. You know, had had opportunities in that game, gave up the pick six late after losing the lead uh, to Oregon. Played Oregon well. I mean, you got to give them credit. Oregon's a, a top 20 team, <clears throat> but Texas Tech being 0 and 2 is is probably another surprise in this league. Um, uh, other than that, Big 12 kind of seems to be I, I, the other team. I would say is better than I thought. Cincinnati. I mean, I I thought they might be the worst team in the league. Uh, but they look like they could be decent, be a decent pit team. So that, that would be my takes. 
Yeah, Cincinnati was the one that yesterday I was most <laughs> impressed by because they, they got a big lead and just held on <laughs> to it uh, and rolled through. Um, and, I, I mean, I, I wasn't convinced that they were going to be able to be competitive and that it would work immediately. And I still don't think it will, but it helps the league that they were able to go and take care of their ACC opponent, no matter who it was, and finish it off. And um, Emory Jones wasn't anything special yesterday, but there was also bad weather all throughout the East Coast, so I'm sure they had some weird stuff going on there. Uh, but they were up 20-7 to at halftime. They led 27-7, to um, and, and Pitt only made it close with uh, some touchdowns in the, in the fourth quarter. Um, now, they did play most of the fourth quarter as a tight game, Pitt got within a score with like 11 minutes left, but Cincinnati was able to hold on. Uh, I, the, the game that I'll point out, I was there on Friday night uh, watching the Illini and the Jayhawks. And number one, I hate to say it, Illinois might be bad at football this year. <laughs> that, that team did not look very good. Uh, I had to watch what I said to, to, to Alec because we were sitting in the Illinois friends and family section and Luke Altmeyer, their quarterback, uh, his mom and grandma were sitting right behind us. Uh, and then everybody else is like, I don't know the players on the team. So if I start making comments, like, I don't know who's behind me or whatever. Um, it, they showed some fight there. But what we continue to learn is KU's offense is certainly one of the better ones in the Big 12. They have the playmakers to do it. And there's a little bit of that element of, of luck there. Jalen Daniels and Will Howard have some of the same things going on for them in terms of they are very confident in themselves and the guys catching balls for them. And when it works, it is flipping awesome. And when it doesn't, it could go really, really wrong. And through two games, Jalen Daniels, it has not hurt him. He's only obviously played in one. Will Howard, he has the two picks, but it hasn't hurt him either. That's probably something to watch for both of those guys. But they, KU looked good enough out there the defense there are still plenty of holes I, Illinois did not run the ball as much as they should have they kind of ditched it pretty quick at different times they should have stuck with it a little bit more um, but KU was was good offensively I mean Andy Kotelnicki is the real deal there it it is very possible that in a 14 team league the two best coordinators in that league are in the state of Kansas right now because Colin Klein and Andy Kotelnicki are both doing awesome things with limited talent in terms of, you know, what's expected based off of recruiting versus other teams in the league. And I will also say this, all these KU fans coming at me, I've got nice things to say for you. The environment there on Friday night was pretty good. It's not like it was as full as, uh, you know, some of the KU media mafia made it out to be uh, before the game, but it was, I was probably 85, 90% full, and everybody was fully bought in for the blackout, and it stayed full basically until the very end of the game, which KU had a massive lead and was going to win that game basically from halftime, you knew it. Um, so the environment was good, and that's one of those that I've said since you know the, the offseason. I already think what well, that's game 11 for K-State. I think K-State will be going there. It'll be a similar deal again this year. I bet that ends up being like a night game on FS1 or something. And that will be a very cool environment, probably for the first time in a lot of people's lifetimes that a game in Lawrence for K-State KU has had an environment like that. Um, and, and it's something to probably look forward to. Um, but KU was impressive in what they did. They just came out and, and popped Illinois in the mouth early, got their win secured. And I was going to bring up Cincinnati, but the other one that I want to you know give a shout out to, mainly because they avoided embarrassment, unlike Houston, UCF hits their game-winning field goal in Boise to uh, win 18-16. to Beautiful score yesterday. Um, that's just a big deal for, for the Big 12 to be able to, to get that taken care of. Um, but for K-State, that's the first conference opponent in two weeks. UCF maybe not as, as stout of a team as we thought because Boise got whooped by Washington uh, in, in week one. And now I know it's a home game for Boise this week as opposed to being on the road, but still something to, to kind of take stock of. Uh, and then the other one, Iowa State, they are a bad football team as well. They lose 20 to 13 to Iowa. Um, that's just that was the most Iowa Iowa State game that could have played out yesterday. I mean, it well, not good at all. Matt Campbell said it's the best football game that they've ever played since he's been there. What do, what do you mean? 
So I got some context on that because I immediately, speaking of Alec again, uh, he's now he he now covers Iowa State for for twenty four seven, and I immediately like just fired off. I said, um, "Did Campbell actually say this today?" And he said, "Yes." Speaking specifically about the Cyhawk game, so only talking mm-hmm. about that game. They I said won, they, they won, won the game year. last year. He's like, "Yeah, but they didn't play well." And I said, "If he thinks they played well this year, then I don't know what to tell him because." <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm lost on his logic sometimes. And uh, Alec has only been in Ames for like two or three weeks. He's got great perspective on this. He says, Campbell is way too much about doing it the right way and not winning games. He would get eaten alive by a ton of fan bases. And that is the truth. Like, Matt Campbell is in the perfect spot for him. He's been really good at, at, at Iowa State. But he is perfect for them because they have never had high levels of success so his seven wins for them, that is that is perfect. They, they will ride off into the sunset with that. And, I mean, Campbell was the, the bell of the ball for a while in the Big 12. And I'm not trying to just keep continuously propping up KU here, but it does seem likely that as long as Leipold sticks around, Lance Leipold is going to get KU to surpass what Matt Campbell got Iowa State to, just because I think Lance Leipold gets it a lot more. Because I think if if KU had gone out and lost twenty to thirteen to Illinois, in no world is Lance Leipold saying KU did anything well in that game. He would probably say a lot of negative things. Matt Campbell just it's sunshine and roses for that guy, which is very odd for somebody that is clearly a hothead that loses his mind sometimes. But uh, those are the the Big Twelve games that that mostly st- stood out to me yesterday. I'll say this real quick because I'm still not fully bought into Texas. Impressive win. It certainly will catapult them to number one in my Big 12 power rankings this week. But this is also clearly a very different Alabama team in past years. And mainly because for the first time, and you'd have to go back a while, Nick Saban either bottomed out on what they did developing a quarterback or they were woefully underprepared for Bryce Young to leave them because Jalen Milrow just is not the guy right now. And he may get there but they don't have a quarterback on the roster that can make them be as good as they were last year, which was a disappointing year for Alabama going to the Sugar Bowl is like a, a, what, a two or three loss team. So um, I I think that that says a lot more about the the state of um, Alabama, but Texas also going in there and winning it because they they had moments where it looked like it was going to slip away from them and be a classic Texas game. They went out, they did it. They've got the best win of the year in the Big 12 so far. Uh, and, and they've proven, at least to this point, they are for real. The one thing to consider, as as well as with them and Texas Tech, these are non-conference games, and the games that ultimately are going to matter, uh, they start in two weeks, and everything could change at that point, and we'll we'll see how it ends up working out. Any thoughts on what I said? Are you guys, you guys ready to roll on? Well, Mason, you just need to work on being the best version of yourself you can be. And this needs to be the most together KSO show. Yes. That should be our goal, to be the most together on this KSO show as we've ever been. Well, I I think we've gotten there. Uh, And we'll just try and and better ourselves next week as as people and everything else. (laughs) Honestly, I don't I don't I don't care if this this gets one view or one download. Like my goal was never to get good distribution. (laughs) on here it was just it was for what fan just said i want us to be together uh and and fortunately we are achieving that so it feels really good to uh be in that position and everything uh Uh, i'll 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 throw this out there uh just because you brought up cincinnati fan mm -hmm. brought up cincinnati west virginia is west virginia gonna beat Pitt? oh good call good question they look they were better against penn state than i thought they were i thought penn state was gonna kill them and Penn State only heavily wounded them, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interested in that. That's a good call. I, I will be uh, watching that one with uh, some some serious uh, interest next week. There's potential that Pitt is just really bad. Yeah, there is. Sure. That that's that's that could be uh, that could be the truth. Okay, uh, real quick before we we move on to our one question for next week, uh, I do have to to point this out. Um, Brett McMurphy doing like a a bit here 
Uh, he released his AP Top 25 ballot. We are recording this. This is 9.30 on Sunday morning. So the ballot will come out sometime later today. Brett McMurphy still has K-State number 24 in his Top 25. Uh, here are some other notables on this list for, for Brett McMurphy. Number one, Florida State. Number two, Texas. Um, let's see. Number nine, Ohio State. Number eight, Oregon. Uh, Oregon State at 12. Duke at 15. Again, that one makes zero sense considering the fact that Clemson is nowhere to be found on this list, and they were struggling at halftime with Charleston Southern yesterday. Um, Brett McMurphy, what is this guy doing? What What is Brett thinking? What is going through his head? I ask you to uh, in, in close. Well, Oregon State at 12, but K-State at 24 is so interesting when you look at who they've played. K-State has played so two much better teams than Oregon State has played. San Jose State is pretty good for, in the Mountain West. And it was on the road, but Troy would probably smack San Jose State. So I, I, I don't, I don't understand it. They should at least be similar. Like, there's nothing about those two resumes that's like, oh, one should be twelve and one should be twenty-four. Yeah, and I don't know the the status of UC Davis football, but I'm gonna guess that Semo is better than UC Davis. That would just be my uh, assumption there. Yeah, I think so. I don't know what to make of what he's doing, but it's off. <laughs> we'll just we'll have to see what uh, comes up uh, moving forward. All right, we'll finish it off like we did last week. One question for this coming week, uh, it, either that you want Chris Kleiman to answer on uh, on Tuesday or that you want to see get answered on the field when K-State takes on Missouri. Fan, I'll let you lead off. Yeah, I, I want to see a, a much better performance, and I'm not blaming the backs for this. Probably this goes back to our offensive line comments, but the running backs combined for 28 carries, 110 yards, and a 36% success rate uh, yesterday. That's under four yards of carry, and anytime your success rate is under 40%, that's not a really good day. Uh, Giddens was at 4.3 yards per carry, 33% success rate, and Ward was at uh, 3.6 yards per carry, 37.5% success rate. And I am counting his touchdown catch as a run in my metrics because that was a run play that's not a pass <laughs> but <clears throat> that that has to improve i think to beat the tigers in columbia um they don't necessarily have to have huge games but we've got to be more consistently successful with the the running backs um in our combination of inside zone outside zone and power football that wasn't very good yesterday against uh the troy defensive front I'll say this real quick uh, before we give it to Drew here. Um, the one thing that Mizzou has done well in their first two games is limiting the run. Mm -hmm. South Dakota only managed 46 yards on the ground. Middle Tennessee was 71 yards yesterday. And that's in games where Missouri let very much inferior opponents hang around for a very long time. And that I'll, I'll throw my question out there real quick, and then I'll let Drew be the, the final word here. But that kind of plays into what, I have questions about Missouri has proven that they are, they're not playing good football right now. And there is the opportunity again for K-State to go in there and just lay the law down early in the game and completely take Missouri out of it. And it's not out of the question that that can happen. So my question is, is K-State ready to be firing on all cylinders the second that game kicks off to put the screws to Missouri again early and not let this be, because Missouri has more talent than Troy. So if K-State does what they did with Troy, where K-State's better than Missouri, but if K-State is letting it be a 14-10 to 10 game right before the half and then Mizzou's going to get the ball, that's, that's a much dicier situation to be at on the road against a team like Missouri. K-State just needs to come out and take care of things early and get after it against Missouri because, I mean, they have not shown a whole lot through the first two weeks of the season to impress. I mean, Middle Tennessee had a legit chance to win that game yesterday. Um, so I'm fascinated to see how K-State handles that and if they just go out and are, are ready to pummel Missouri. Uh, I'll throw out for my question is kind of more geared towards like what Mason's was, uh, for like what we want to see on Saturday. Mine is how does K-State contain Luther Burden? Because uh, if you look yesterday, Luther Burden had 117 yards receiving. The next highest Missouri receiver was actually a running back that had one catch for 49 yards. But then the next highest actual like wide receiver had two catches for 18 yards. So if, if you take away Luther Burden, 
it, it doesn't look like the other receivers are at the level that they probably need to be at to be a, like a, a healthy like one two combination. And if they can take away burden, that offense doesn't look as scary because you, you take away burden's yardage, they only threw for they threw for less than a hundred yards. Well, here's what's fascinating. I mean, you guys probably remember last year, and it was only his second game as a college player, but Luther Burden was not getting the ball much at all. Like, it was not coming his way, and everybody's kind of like, why, why is Missouri not using him more? Uh, in Luther Burden's first 12 games as a Missouri Tiger, the most catches he had was six. He did that twice against Kentucky and Abilene Christian. In his last three games, so dating back to their bowl game with Wake last year and then the first two games this year, he has two games with seven catches and one game with eight catches. Uh, and all those games, except for the game against Wake, he's been over 90 yards receiving. So they are obviously making much more of an effort to get the ball to Luther Burden. And like you're saying, Drew, if K-State is able to, to lock him down and prevent that from happening to them, even to that extent, like he can catch seven balls, but make sure it's not for 117 yards like it was yesterday. It doesn't seem like Mizzou has the rest of the receiving core up to speed and ready to go there. And that's really the key thing. And again, we're, we're, we've all have said it. Brady Cook, probably not as good as Gunnar Watson, or at least has not proven it at this point in their career. So there is a quarterback that will be gettable uh, for the Wildcats on Saturday. And we'll see if kind of lifting the lid on the, the turnover bug is, has maybe helped them a little bit. And uh, they'll be ready to, to pounce a little bit more in Columbia because they picked off Mizzou three times last year. So um, there's certainly that opportunity existing there. That will do it for us on this edition of the KSO Sunday show. The three of us will be back next Sunday to recap K-State's game with Missouri in Columbia. I will be back tomorrow with DY as we'll give a quick recap and preview some of the storylines from the week moving forward. And as always, head on over to K-State online. Get signed up if you're not. Be a part of the K-State online community to get the best coverage of the Cats you can and also a lot of melting down or a lot of cheering on for Will Howard and anybody else that uh, wears purple on Saturdays uh, over on, on the message board. So that will do it for us. Also, subscribe to the YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you're finding the show as well uh, to make sure that you're always getting it the second it's there. And uh, we will be back with more action all throughout the week. K-State, Missouri, uh, a revival of the rivalry one more time, at least for uh, the, the currently scheduled series. Uh, because Fan mentioned it earlier, I, I'm excited. Hopefully, K-State gets to go to Boulder next year. That would be uh, a lot of fun for mm -hmm. everybody involved. And that's probably something that if Brett Yormark really is a marketing genius, he should probably do that one. Uh, get get some of the, the old like Big 12 North or Big 8 foes ready to play each other immediately next year. So that's enough rambling to close out the show. I'll just get out of here, and uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be back at some point.